Uh, what we try to do here is to make the chemistry sort of uh, get bigger and bigger as we move through the chapters. And many of you have to take some polymer chemistry in the future, I'd imagine, or biochem, and the molecules just get bigger and bigger. But to answer questions that I've had by email this week and in person, what do you expect from this material on the exam? Well, look for functional groups. An alkene is an alkene, regardless of the size of the molecule, right? An amide is an amide. You know what to do with those molecules, so you should be able to extrapolate that to what to do with these bigger systems. And what I'll do today as I finish this off is point out the functional groups as we go and highlight them so that you can see them as chemists. And so next week, everything that you'll see on Monday, you should be able to do. We've seen it, we've done the chemistry, maybe not in the same molecules, but you should be able to take it with you and use that chemistry in further problems. So on Monday, we talked about the definitions that you should know, not just for now, but for later. Uh, you'll be surprised how often and how, how popular polymers are out there. Those of you who want to be physicians, you make sutures out of polymers. Uh, those of you who want to go into uh, engineering, you make polymers. Right? On a huge scale, so you've got to be able to know what these things are. So have a look at those definitions, make sure you're comfortable with them. And as we work our way through here, I'll try to point out some of the conventions that we use and some of the basic ideas so that you can see the language. Uh, you need to have functional groups. You can't make polymers unless you have functional groups. Alkanes are difficult to polymerize, they don't have anything to, to react with. So on this slide we have collected a bunch of very common functional groups that you've seen a lot of and are familiar with. And we can think about how these things can link together. Now, what we've done so far in the class is we've taken molecule A and molecule B and put them together, right? But how about molecule A and molecule B have two functional groups? And they can link off in different directions. So instead of just going A, B, you can start to link off A, B, A, B, A, B, and keep going in infinite directions. So in terms of what functional groups you'll use here, often we'll be talking about um, double bonds. We'll be talking about uh, alcohols, amines, things like that we know a lot about. Thiols we know a little bit about. They are the sulfur equivalent of alcohols. And then we need an electrophile. To snap these things together, we need electrophiles. Commonly, we'll use uh, carboxylic acid to make carboxylic esters, and we'll use things like uh, amines to make amides. So that group of molecules on that slide shouldn't be uh, anything different, shouldn't be anything new. All we'll do today is start with molecules that have multiple functional groups and try and knit them together in different ways. And that's how polymers come about. So we talked about um, basic definitions of tacticity and all that stuff, but we'll start with this slide today and think about how we do this. Think about what's necessary for this to happen. If your monomer, your simple unit, only has one functional group, you can't polymerize. Yes, it can form a molecule with two pieces joined together, but that's it. You don't have any more functional groups to grow off from. So we'll find now that most of the systems we'll deal with here have at least two functionalities. And those two functionalities can come together to form some sort of bond. But after that initiation or, or that sort of initial step, we still have two functional groups left over on the ends. And they can go again. They can react with further molecules of the monomer, and they can keep going. And as we talked about uh, simple definitions, a trimer is obvious, a, a dimer is obvious. And eventually, if we do this often enough, and we end up with this very, very long chain, we end up with a polymer. Now, you can control these things. That's polymer science. That's beyond the scope of the class. But there are methods to control this, so you get certain molecular weights over others. You can separate these things. But you must be aware that most polymers are not homogenous. Most polymers have component pieces or strands that are different in molecular weight. And we often talk about an average molecular weight when we talk about the structure of a polymer. So what we'll do today is, is dive into this idea of addition polymers, which are exactly what they sound like, and condensation polymers, which uses the chemistry that we've dealt with quite recently, where you condense two pieces together to make new bonds. So the definitions here aren't particularly difficult. What I want to point out again is that the nature of the stereochemical outcome of this process will define the structure and it will define the properties of the polymer. Some polymers are soft, some polymers are brittle and crystalline, and that will often depend upon the regularity of the R groups building off a backbone. So we might call this the polymer chain. This is the polymer backbone in which the chemistries happen to join those pieces together, and then we have some groups sticking off of it. Polystyrene is very similar to this. Polystyrene has a benzene ring sticking off as the R group. And whether those groups are pointing in the front or the back will make a difference in terms of how well the chains then pack together. And all that intermolecular idea will lead to whether it's crystalline or not. So uh, in terms of uh, isotactic, that's very good because everything's on the same side and you can control this these days. Uh, in terms of syndiotactic, everything seems to be front, back, front, back, front, back. It is alternating. That will have something to say about the overall bolt property of the molecules. And the last one we talked about was atactic, where everything's random. And these tend not to be crystalline because they don't have a regular structure and therefore they can't actually dock next to each other. It's very difficult for them to get next to each other and form crystals. So I brought in some other pictures. These are not on your slides, but this is, this is FYI stuff just to enhance what I've just talked about. You can see at the top a regular polymer, isotactic, in which the R groups, the methyl groups in this case, are all pointing in the same direction. Go all the way back to the beginning of freshman chem and then my class in 3719, you'd, you'd argue about intermolecular properties. 
straight chains with nothing pointing out are easy to get next to. You start putting groups in the way, things start to get blocked. The intermolecular forces aren't as strong. But you could argue now that if you have regular R groups sticking off, then certainly a chain of this can get next to another chain of that, and you should be able to get some decent interaction between those chains, which will hold them together and maybe allow the molecule to crystallize. Whereas down at the bottom, you have the random one, the atactic system, in which everything is just random. Everything is just wherever it wants to go. There's no stereochemical control at all in terms of the formation of that thing. And so the properties of this thinking is a, a very, you know, on a very simple level ought to be different. Maybe it won't crystallize because we can't get good packing because the molecules can't get close to each other. So know what those definitions mean so you can point them out and we can talk about them. And I'll use them as we go through here. So as you dive into polymer science, and I think the engineers have to do some polymer stuff in the future, I would imagine so, yeah? Uh, you'll start talking about the properties of these things, the post-chemistry. You've done the chemistry, you've made the polymer. What then does it do? What, ap what applied uh, things can we, what can we apply it to? What are the applications? And some of the language that you have to be aware of, and again, if you've you know, got some interest in, in chemistry in general, this is, this is interesting. Uh, you have amorphous polymers, which are, tend to be powders, and you have crystalline or semi-crystalline polymers, which are exactly like you would think in the lab. You crystallize things, you get a crystal, which has certain properties. And it all depends upon the growth and how close these molecules can get to each other. So if you have some sort of chain that is uh, very, very long, you can imagine it wrapping around like this. And the biologist might see this as something interesting because this looks like a lipid bilayer, pre-organized. It looks like maybe a transmembrane protein, which has found itself into that lipid bilayer. It is doing exactly what a polymer would do, which is loop around. And so you can get organization in these systems based on inter and intramolecular bonds or intramolecular forces that allow the system to aggregate or to come together to form different properties, different types of material. So some of these things will be soft polymers, some of these things will be hard polymers, depending upon the nature of the uh, stereochemistry involved. And at the bottom, we can see a bigger sort of macroscopic picture, which is getting into the engineering side of things, looking at the bulk properties. And I, again, I'd advise people to get involved in research. There's a lot of opportunities now in STEM and research. Uh, you can do lots of analysis here that we couldn't do five years ago. All this SEM, TEM stuff that we have uh, access to, undergraduates are, are uh, uh, push towards those things. So you can actually look at these things in the bulk scale. Now that's not chemistry to me, that's starting to get into physical properties and engineering. That's sort of as, as far as I go there. But polymers, again, their properties are based on their chemical structures. They're based on what's available in the molecule. So I have a collection of different reactions just to summarize this, and there's nothing difficult here, there's nothing new here, in fact. It is just an application of reactions that we have seen again and again. Everybody's heard of polyethylene. What's polyethylene used for? sheeting, polyene, polyethylene sheets and plastic bags and things like that, very common. And you make it by two different processes. You take ethylene. Now, I've got to be careful here because I'm trying to think about definitions that are important. I want to talk about monomer, the piece that you use to get this thing going, that then attacks, it attacks itself and it builds up into a polymer. And repeating unit. We've got to be able to define the repeating unit in the system. So the polymer at the right is showing a whole bunch of these CH2, CH2 groups coming together under two different types of condition and we're getting a long chain. And all of a sudden, the alkenes have gone. The alkenes have gone because they've done addition reactions, and you've ended up with a saturated system. But we ought to be able to point out that the repeating unit is just that. It's a two-carbon piece. Now, you can't have a one-carbon repeat, right? One-carbon repeat doesn't make any sense for these things. But you certainly can have two and three and four and five, depending upon what you start with. So you ought to be able to identify the repeating unit in each of these polymers, not having been given the starter material. So with that in mind, in terms of the chemistry, what's happening here? 200 degrees C, what do we expect to happen at 200 degrees C? Maybe some bonds get broken. Maybe the pi bond gets broken. Maybe the pi bond becomes radicals. Maybe they then do some radical reactions. We'll see that. Or peroxide. Peroxides initiate what? Radicals. That's for sure a radical reaction. So we can imagine adding to radicals or adding radicals to double bonds, making a new radical, and then that finding a double bond and making a new radical and keep going. So you get these infinite sort of propagation steps in that system, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, everybody's familiar with this stuff. Where do you find this stuff, Pierce? Oh, you've been in the kitchen, have you? Very good. Um, this is found on frying pans and things like that, non-stick surfaces. The fluorine here is, is very slippery. It doesn't tend to bond to things. And the surface of this material now is, is dictated, the property is dictated by the fact that you have fluorine on there. So just going from ethylene to tetrafluoroethylene makes a huge difference in the property of that thing. Think about polyethylene being a very soft polymer, and then Teflon is, is a, a harder material. So the processes will be similar. It will be simple stuff like radical chemistry or cation chemistry to be able to put the things together. Uh, plexiglass, this is methyl methacrylate as the starter material. And if you go to Home Depot or to Lowe's or whatever and you buy some of this false glass, the plexiglass, uh, it's very hard. 
and the chemical properties again are based on the form, on the groups attached. You have methyl groups and you have carboxymethyl groups up there. And the properties there have been discovered to be very hard, very useful, but the chemistry is very similar. You'll do uh, uh, radical type reactions to make these things. At the bottom, I have a summary. The bottom is just to make sure that you're okay with what's going on here. We will, instead of just doing A plus B, we're going to do A plus A plus A plus A plus A infinitely because there's nothing else in there to react. So you've got to keep in mind that these reactions are set up very carefully to avoid other processes. You, you try to deoxygenate them. You try to avoid oxygen being in there because oxygen is a radical and it can react with other radicals. And what you want to happen is your monomer to start some initiation process and then to react with another monomer. That's all that's in there is the other monomer. And eventually you have many, 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 and you end up with polymers. So the bottom is kind of a, a, a summary idea where we have some initiating species. That could be a proton, it could be a nucleophile, or it could be a radical. They're the three processes that we spent a lot of time on in this class. And we form some new species. The initiating species adds to the alkene, and you produce a new radical. So what type of, group, what type of reaction is that? What's the term you would use for that? You start with a radical, and you generate a new radical. That's propagation. That is a propagation step if it's a radical process. Now, again, what we've done here is we've been very careful to avoid anything else in there. There's no water in here. There's no oxygen in here so that we avoid reactions with those species. We want to react with the carbon-based material. So then we can go again. We can make a trimer. This radical now needs help. It's got to find something else. And you keep doing this infinitely until something happens to stop it. And that something might be a termination step or it might be precipitation from the solution. Maybe you get to a point where the stuff is no longer soluble and it drops out of solution and there's your product. So we'll do this with three different things. We'll do it with radicals, and we'll do it with uh, anions, and we'll do it with carbocations. And the chemistry here is fairly simple. So in terms of definitions, a radical polymerization is exactly what it sounds like. It's a very simple process to do. You put an initiator in the reaction vessel, you put your materials in, you heat it up, you get the radical breaking apart in the initiator, and you can then think about that radical reacting with a double bond. And that double bond will go on and react with something else, and we'll get these chains, and we'll keep growing until we stop. Cationic polymerization, the usual initiator here is fairly obvious, H+. We've done a lot of that. We added H+, to a whole bunch of alkenes last semester. We did Markovnikov addition type processes. But now what we're saying is there's nothing else in there. There's nothing else in there that will attack the carbocation other than another double bond of the other molecule. So we'll get polymerization based on that. Down further, we've got anionic polymerization. This is the counterintuitive one. You can actually attack double bonds with powerful nucleophiles, and you can make them into carbanions. And then those carbanions will attack another molecule, and another molecule, and so on. You'll get bigger molecules that way. The one that I won't talk about, but is, is very, very interesting, I hope the uh, engineers get to see this in the future. It's a big subject. The idea of coordination uh, polymerization, where we use a metal to do this. That's more inorganic chemistry and sort of more specialized, so we'll leave that for later. But certainly the first three. These are very common ways of making polymers based on chemistry that you have learned in this, these two semesters. So to start off with, addition polymers, are obviously, uh, they, they add things. You've got double bonds which add things, whether it be a proton or a radical, and they just keep on adding until they stop. To start off with, we have peroxide. Tell me about this bond. Weak. Yeah, lone pairs next to each other, not a good bond. If you heat it up, it will break. And it will give you two oxygen radicals. And you can bet oxygen radicals are reactive. Oxygen does not like losing electrons. It wants to get them back. Well, all we have in this mixture now is alkene. And the way you set this up is you put a little bit of initiator. You don't need very much, maybe 1%. And when you've made your oxygen radicals, the vast majority of what else is in this mixture is alkene. So this radical goes after a molecule of alkene, and it adds. And you make this. And that's the first step of the propagation process. You now have a carbon-based radical, maybe not as bad as the oxygen radical, but it certainly isn't good and it wants to react, and it can go further. And again, we're doing this carefully so that all that's left here is alkene, a lot of it. We go after that and we make this trimeric species, and then we keep going and going and going. And this will go on infinitely until it stops. At the end of that, it might precipitate, and then you also get the downside. You also get the problems that we used to get with radical reactions. You tend to get termination steps. Now, that's not such a big deal here if the monomer is fairly simple, if the polymer is fairly simple. Because if you couple these two things in a termination step, you get a polymer. Okay? You get what you're after anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So that's how it works for radicals. It's just repeating the same process again and again and again until something st happens to stop it. But people will say, well, this isn't all carbon. There are a couple of, there are a couple of oxygens in here. And the properties of the, of the polymer might be affected by having oxygen in there. Instead of it just being a non-polar material, which is just carbon, 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 what's the problem with having these oxygens at the end? 
Well, let's be aware of the fact that this chain is nowhere near representing how long that chain is. So you might have 10 million carbons in there and two oxygens. What's going to win? 10 million carbons. So the bulk properties of that material will have very little of anything to do with the oxygen being present. It doesn't matter because the thing is so big and it acts as an alkane, pretty much. So initiation type systems, radical reactions are fairly well used and fairly well understood. And it's just an explanation again, or just an application again, of material we saw last year. So those terms, and again, you want to know these things at the, at the end of the semester, and you want to come out of here having learned something. Other ways of doing this, or other molecules you can make doing this, include things like vinyl chloride. What's the most obvious uh, application of polyvinyl chloride? My favorite application. Say again? Sprinkler lines is one of them. That's not my favorite, though. My favorite is vinyl siding. Right? PVC is used for vinyl siding, and it keeps your house dry, or it should. And you think about the chemical properties of this stuff. You start out with vinyl chloride. There's the vinyl group with two carbons. There's the chloride. And you polymerize, most often doing radical chemistry, and you get polyvinyl chloride. Now, again, I'm going to point out the monomer unit, which is the double two carbons here and a chlorine. And that's now reduced down to this in the polymer. You can represent that huge molecule, millions of molecular weight, by that simple reduction. The N on the outside suggests a certain number of repeat units. And the properties of this stuff, well, you think about this. Again, the oxygen is negligible. It doesn't play any role whatsoever. But do you think this stuff is water-soluble or insoluble? Insoluble. You would hope so. And this is produced on you know, thousands and thousands of tons to be formed into things like plastics and uh, vinyl siding to protect your house. And it works quite well. The downside to vinyl siding is you can't get rid of it. Right? There's no chemistry out there that will simply get rid of vinyl siding. So once you change things out in your house, uh, that stuff goes to a landfill. Now, in terms of other types of uh, systems to do here, we've got to use carbocations. We've got to use anions. At the top, we have the carbocation example. And what we need here is some acid. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a proton. It can be a Lewis acid. And don't forget now, Lewis acids are anything that can accept electrons. So boron's very good at this. Aluminium is very good at this. Things that can pick up a pair of electrons. And what we're doing here is we are producing a carbocation. And in this particular case, we've added the proton, in this case, to one end of the molecule, and we've produced a tertiary cation. That's a Markovnikov addition. But that carbocation needs some help. And again, we've been careful to keep this simple and keep it uh, avoid, you know, trying to avoid any sort of extra additives and any, bi any sort of contaminants in here. And we're now going to get the alkene attacking the carbocation. So that second step is simply the same thing. You're adding an electrophile to a double bond. And you're making this, in this case, four carbon piece. And then it goes again. Now, you put this together with that lipid synthesis we saw earlier, where you had that cyclization event to make the cholesterol precursor. That's the same type of thing. Double bond reacting with carbocation, double bond reacting with carbocation again and again and again. It's very much the same concept. So you keep doing this, and it keeps going on until, again, something happens to, to stop this. In this case, what's happened? What type of reaction has happened to stop that? This is my goal on Monday for some of this chemistry, is for you to look at bigger molecules, not freak out, and have some good, in, good informed opinion of what's happening. What type of reaction is happening to give me that double bond? Not a termination necessarily. It does terminate. You could use that language. But what's, what chemically is happening to go from here down to here? Deprotonation. But give me a mechanism. What, what mechanism is it from a carbocation? E1. Again, many of you have to take this with you. Many of you have to do standardized tests in the future based on this material, which, let's face it, is why you're here. And you're going to see it in biochem and things like that. So make sure we understand these processes. That would be an E1 process. Lose the proton, and we end up with that alkene. Now, that can happen, and that can then lead to, you can imagine, heterogeneity in terms of the polymer outcome. Not all the chains will be the same length, because some of them terminate earlier. That's why we get different uh, chain lengths. So it works nicely with carbocations, if you've got a system that allows for that. And it also works for anions. And this actually is very popular in the industry. It doesn't look very intuitive to me, because you're taking a base and you're reacting it with an alkene. And we didn't see much of that at all in the class. So what's going on here is the very powerful nucleophile is attacking the double bond. And we are putting the charge at this end. Why do you think you should put the charge there? Yeah, it's right next to the benzene ring, which is going to stabilize it by uh, electron delocalization, and so it's very much a sim simple idea. Nothing tricky there. But again, you've got this system where there's only alkene available. You haven't used much base, maybe 1%, and this now has to go find some help, and so it goes on and it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. 
And again, we have this little guy at the, at the beginning to start things off, but it has very little to say about the properties of the material because it's so small. The vast majority of that material is carbon with phenyl groups attached, and that then is polystyrene. And polystyrene has its own interesting properties. So we can do this three ways, radicals, cations, and carbonions, all of which we've learned. So now we can start to apply this to some interesting materials. In terms of applications, yes, Pierce, it's in the, uh, what's that room called, the kitchen? And you can see now the polymer is linear. And you build a molecule of it, same way, and you can use it for this. What's this stuff? Where do you find that stuff? Plumbing tape, right? Home Depot, great stuff. Whenever you get a house, you have to buy some of this stuff, right? Stops your taps from leaking. Uh, same material. It's waterproof. It does not dissolve in water. It's very useful to repel water. So it's got all sorts of useful properties. In terms of other things, I just brought this in because I thought it was interesting. Uh, plexiglass, the contrast between these materials. Uh, polystyrene, I think we've already seen, is very soft. Plexiglass is very hard. Yeah, this thing will break. It's actually some, somewhat dangerous. And plexiglass, the monomers, is this. And it comes together and it makes this material. It has a carboxymethyl group sticking off of it and a methyl group. And those two functional groups, going from H's to fluorines to these two, have changed the properties completely. And this stuff is transparent. It's easy to work with. You can, you can mill this stuff quite easily. You can make all kinds of things like signs. Uh, it's useful in place of glass in terms of you know, mirrors and things like that, or uh, picture frames and things like that. Uh, you can mold it into all sorts of shapes like this, you know, this guitar. And somebody made a car out of it. Right? Somebody made an entire vehicle. It was a 1940 Pontiac or something out of plexiglass just to prove how useful this stuff was. So it's got lots of versatility and it's very hard and very resistant to, to wear. Uh, things that you may be aware of, things that you've already seen, certainly STEM are big at this at the moment, is this idea of thermoplastics. The idea of plastics that you heat up and when they cool down they, get this, they go back to the same, not necessarily the same shape, but they are the same compound. They don't decompose. So they're thermally stable. Now that's useful because you can heat these things up and spray them. And you've probably heard about 3D printing. If you haven't, you've been asleep. And the idea that, you know, why is Youngstown is actually a center for this stuff now. Uh, you need material for this. A lot of the early stuff was done with plastics. Now people are using ceramics. A lot of the emphasis here is on ceramics. But we use polymers, polymers for this. Uh, we can start off with simple monomers, acrylonitrile, okay? 1,3-butadiene, which we've seen, styrene, which we've seen. And you mix these things together, and you get a polymerization of all three of them. So it's a cross-polymer. This will be a, a heteropolymer. And the unit for this, I would not ask you to draw a, uh, the brackets for this one because it's quite tricky. But you can see here you have the three things joined to each other to make a polymer which has some very interesting properties. And this is ABS, which comes from the three letters, acrylonitrile, butadiene, styrene. And that stuff is the most popular material used in these simple 3D printers that you can buy. Yeah, I've got one of these things at home. It's loads of fun. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like the iPad. It's like when the iPad first came out, people just sat there and went, what the hell are you going to do with this? And I'm still working out what the hell to do with this, but you know, it's the same idea. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's, it's great from when uh, the, the in-laws come over with their kids because they just think it's amazing. And all that's happening is that you're spraying plastic in three dimensions. You're using like a, digit, like a printer where it sprays ink, and you just spray, and then you go up a level, and you spray again, you go up a level, and you keep going, and you can make 3D, make 3D objects quite quickly. And some of the things we've got at YSU now can do this sort of thing. You know, we can make these very large materials and very large products. And the idea here is revolutionary because it's very it's it's the opposite to what we normally do if you think about building a house normally what we do is go find a bunch of trees and then chop them all down and then mill them into wood to build your house but you've got rid of a lot of that tree right you've done uh, uh subtractive manufacturing right you've had to take a large piece and take things out of it to make something you want well this is the opposite this has no waste because you're adding things layer by layer Instead of chopping stuff out, you're just adding it for what you want. There's no waste. But the problem with this, again, is that these things are becoming quite popular, and people are starting to make these completely useless 3D objects uh, that are kind of fun for kids to play with, but you know, they get bored of that after five minutes. Um, what do you do with the waste? This stuff does not decompose. This stuff is, is nasty. This ABS stuff is a problem. The simplest way to get rid of it is to heat the crap out of it and make it decompose, but that's poisonous. And nobody wants that. You know, nobody wants that near them. You don't want an incinerator near you. So again, where do they end up? Landfill. What we need to do now is start developing these things where we can um, change that. And I'll mention that in a second. So I point this out because you should be aware of this. Uh, you know, a lot of people are down on Youngstown, but you know, there are some good things here. Uh, America makes downtown. Is anybody aware of this? If you're not, you should be. If you get a chance, go visit because they've got all sorts of printers. They'll 
show you and some good ideas. Uh, the idea is that everybody will have one of these in their homes eventually. Kind of like a fridge, yeah, or an iPad. What are you going to do with an iPad? I don't know. But everybody will get one. And you'll be able to, you know, you, you, instead of going down to Home Depot to buy uh, uh, some kind of bolt or something or some kind of uh, washer that you need, you make it yourself at home. You just print it yourself. That's the whole idea eventually. What they're trying to do now is develop into ceramics. Obviously, with the automotive industry around here and some of the uh, people who are working on uh, high, melting temp high melting materials, uh, they're interested in making things like brakes for cars, interested in making engine parts, which are resistant to temperature degradation, and by building them up, instead of taking a bunch of metal and chopping half of it out and throwing it away, you build it up from the ground. So if you get a chance, have a look at that, and certainly get involved if you're in the engineering field, because that's a big deal these days. The problem with polymers is that they're very difficult to decompose. And this becomes really important when you start to think about the economics of this. Uh, we have something like, is it 8 billion people on the planet now? Which is a ridiculous growth in 100 years. And we are becoming wealthier for the most part, and people are more demanding in terms of what they want. Everybody has a mobile phone. Everybody has a car. Yeah. So now those materials that are used to build those things, where do they go when you finish with it? You throw them out. The, gar the garbage people come on a Monday and they take it away for you. And then it magically disappears, and you don't care anymore. But unfortunately, it magically disappears to landfills. And you've got problems with uh, landfills being close to towns. Is anybody aware of NIMBY? Do you know what NIMBY means? Not in my backyard. You'll get used to that as you get older. Um, these are problems. People do not want to have things like incinerator plants or landfills in their backyards. So this becomes a political problem. And in this country, it's not that. You haven't hit a critical point yet because it's so huge, this place. But in Britain, where it's an island, and you, you really can't build off into the sea, you know, you've got to recycle things, you've got to rebuild things. So that's, that's a big thing that's stuck in Europe, but it's starting to take off over here. I said on the other day that this stuff, while it's very useful, I got, I got a tool delivered yesterday at home from Amazon, and it came in this huge great box with this huge great styrofoam padding, and I thought, oh crap, here we go again. All right? Now my tool wouldn't have made it to my home intact if it hadn't had this padding. There's no alternative to this just yet. But it is a problem because it's so light. Its density is minimal. So one kilogram of this stuff you know, fills up a, a huge volume. How do you get rid of it? Well, look at the chemistry involved. Polystyrene, if I go back, is an alkane. Okay? It's an alkane. It's got a whole bunch of carbon, 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 carbon bonds. There are no functional groups on there. No, but no microorganism will recognize that. Nothing in the ground will recognize that to eat it and use it as fuel. So how do you get rid of this stuff? You either burn it, you melt it, or you recycle it. And the only reason, or the only way recycling becomes viable is when it's economically viable, when people can make money off of it. And it's actually starting to happen, I think. But we've got problems with this stuff because, again, it floats in the ocean and it's difficult to get rid of, and there are, there are millions of tons of this stuff floating around. So if you can invent a molecule or a compound that has the same properties as polystyrene, you will make lots of money if you can get rid of it at the end. In terms of vinyl siding I mentioned, very cheap, very easy to make. If you want to get your house, apparently it's about $10,000 to get your house completely re-sided with, with polyvinyl, polyvinyl chloride. That's not that much when you buy a house, and that's an option. So now think about where that goes too, polyvinyl chloride. It's carbon-carbon bonds. How do you break carbon-carbon bonds? You heat the crap out of it. You incinerate it, but when you incinerate it, you make chlorides, and chlorides are carcinogenic, and chlorides cause problems with the ozone. So again, we've got this big problem. where We've, we've all been, since World War II, gung-ho about building stuff, and using these types of materials, but then later on, what do we do with it? You've got to be careful. And again, uh, biological decomposition would be very useful. It would be nice if you could get some bacteria, some microorganism that's been developed to use this as fuel. That would be another you know, biological engineering project to be able to degrade these things and get smaller molecules back that then could be recycled. That's starting to happen. Uh, so now, there is political and sort of environmental pressure to get away from using this stuff, but there, it's still the best answer. And the vast majority of, of you in your lifetimes, I think, will still use this stuff. Now, you know, this used to be a funny slide because this was used to be on TV. Nobody remembers what this is now. Anybody remember what this is? It's a 70s show, of course it is. Back in the day, people thought it would be a really good idea if you make clothes out of nylon and polyesters. And back in the 70s, for those of us who were around in the 70s, polyester was everything, right? Everybody had polyester shirts. It's junk, right? It's nasty. Uh, but that's what people made clothes out of because it was cheap and it was easy to work with, and you can get lots of it very quickly. And polyester, uh, polyesters are an example of a condensation polymer. 
in which we take a carboxylic acid and we condense it with that. And what's the byproduct, Jessica? Water! Water, of course it is. The condensation product is water, as it has been for every single Fischer reaction that we've done. The difference here is that you have a monomer that has two functional groups, and you have a monomer that has two functional groups, and they're compatible. So instead of just coupling one together to make one ester, you couple both ends together to make a longer molecule. But at the end of that molecule, you've got more functional groups, and you keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going until it precipitates. So you can see here now polyesters being formed. You've got polyethylene terephthalate. I'll show you what that's used for in a second. But they're very useful materials. Now, these things aren't quite as bad as the plastics I just showed you because they contain esters. Esters are a functional group. They are a chemical handle. How can you break an ester down? What can you do to get rid of an ester and turn it back into a carboxylic acid? You can use water and acid, or else you can use what? What's the name of the reaction that takes an ester and it turns it back into a carboxylate and eventually a carboxylic acid? Saponification, right? You can do saponification. So there are methods to degrade these things. And you can actually recycle some of the starter materials because you get them back. So these things aren't as bad as the first ones. But again, they have different properties. These things tend to form long fibers. Long fibers aren't much use to you if you're trying to make a sheet of plastic. So we, we need to work on that. So overall, we have some dicarboxylic acid. And this bit in the middle is interesting because it could be anything. It could be a benzene ring. It could be a long chain. It could be a banana, whatever you want. And you put these two things together, and you can make all sorts of interesting structures very quickly. Now, I think we've moved on from sort of polyesters in the, in the 70s. Uh, uh, but they do have lots of uses in, th in things like uh, water bottles and things like that. So we make them by condensing. There's nothing tricky there. You should be able to do mechanisms here. If I give you a dimer or a, a starter material, you should be able to condense these things to make a polymer. Nylons, in terms of polyamides, this is something that, again, has revolutionized the way we, we work and the way we live. Uh, polymers, since the, since the Second World War, have really changed things. Without the polymers, you can't make the, these things. You can't make cell phones without the cases and things like that. So miniaturization has been possible because of polymers. And you can see their structure now is very similar to the polyesters. We have some starter material, which is a carboxylic acid, and we have an amine. Instead of a diol, we have a diamine. And those diamines can come together to couple to give you long chain polyamides. And these things are very much similar to proteins. Polyamide chemistry and from here and polyamide chemistry and proteins is very much the same. So types of systems we would use, a diphic acid is very common, six carbons, and one six uh, hexane diamine is very common, six carbons. That's where the name comes from, nylon 6-6 is simply the number of molecules, the number of atoms involved, six and six. Nylon six is formed by this thing here, six amino hexanoic acid. I'll show you where that comes from in a second. So you have this end coupled with a molecule, of, another molecule at that end, and then you keep going. And you get a different type of nylon based on six carbon units that we call nylon six. So the chemistry is very similar. What you need to have happen here is a condensation between those two functional groups, lose a molecule of water, and you end up with an amide. Now, amides are very robust. We've said that again many times. These things are difficult to break down. But because you have a functional group there, you can break them down, unlike the alkane products. So you can imagine some bacterium or some microorganism getting hold of this thing and chewing it up, just using it as food uh, to be able to liberate the uh, products. So those polyamides have all sorts of use. And they do lead into some very interesting materials chemistry and some very interesting biochemistry. So what we have here is the repeats for nylon six. There's one carbon, two, three, four. Sorry, four. There are four carbons there, one, two, three, four. You might call this nylon, uh, no, it is four, six, or something like that, with the two repeat units. Because we have the amide bond present, we have very robust linkages. Those molecules are not going to break apart very easily. But look in between the, between the chains. If you put two of these chains together next to each other, this will see this, and this will see this, and this will see this. So you have great strength in different directions. You have strength in a linear sense because you have the amide bonds, and you have strength in a, in a sideways sense because the hydrogen bonding, which you can show like that, is holding these things together. So these things form fibers. Nylon fibers, which you've got all sorts of uses. Climbing ropes you can make out of these things, which are very strong. And you can imagine now why these would be, this would be so because of all of those different interactions. Nylon six. I've always wanted to put a picture of a toothbrush on my slides. I finally got to do it. Next time you brush your teeth, which hopefully is soon, those fibers are made out of nylon, nylon six. And the way we make nylon six, 
is to take a molecule called E caprolactam and you heat it up high. And if you heat it up, it breaks apart and it opens up into a bifunctional molecule. And that bifunctional molecule then attacks other bifunctional molecules to form amide bonds. And again, we get fibers, and those fibers are very, very, very tough. Any idea what the E stands for? Think about the nomenclature we've developed over the, over the semester here. There's alpha. There's beta. What's this? Gamma. What's this? What's this? Epsilon. Right? Simply the carbon linkage. That's all there is to it. So again, lots of use for a very simple molecule. And the properties of these things are, are very, very impressive. And you can see now organic chemists, polymer chemists, materials chemists, they can build up these very simple ideas to make all sorts of new materials. Things in biomedicine, stuff like that, things, things in biological engineering to produce skin grafts and all sorts of things. This is just the beginning. In terms of the repeat units, again, I'm leading somewhere here. Look at this. All these chains line up next to each other and they interact by hydrogen bonding. That is very similar to DNA, very similar to RNA, when those pieces come together to give you helices and to give you uh, duplexes and triplexes. If you continue this, you get a mesh, and you get very strong materials that are robust. They're difficult to break apart. And possibly the best example of that, when I get there in a few minutes, will be Kevlar. Okay, But that's how we make them. Decomposition, well, we can actually decompose sticks to get back to E-caprolactam, that's possible, but that costs energy. Uh, they're not going to break down very easily in the environment, but you can, if you cook them up, you can hydrolyze them. We know that amides are strong, it's going to take a, some work to hydrolyze them. Uh, we can also do the saponification equivalent and we can break those molecules down, so you can recycle amides and uh, polyamides. Uh, one of the polyesters that we talked about, everybody's familiar with this, okay? Everybody's familiar with drinking water bottles, or water. And again, it's an age thing, I think. If you'd have told me when I was your age that people would pay to be sold bottled water in a plastic bottle and they would pay a dollar a bottle, I thought you were an idiot. But that's what happened. People now buy water, water in bottles. And those plastic bottles come from somewhere and they're usually formed from polyethylene terephthalate. The problem with polyethylene terephthalate, if you think about its chemical structure, it should not be soluble in water. But everything's soluble in water to a little bit, a little degree. So if you keep recycling these water bottles again and again and keep using the same one, you run the risk of a little bit of that stuff getting into the water, and then it gets into you, and that's not good, right? So maybe we can get away from that. Maybe we can produce some compounds that don't have that side effect, that don't have that problem. But in this case, uh, this is one of these things that we do heat up to decompose, and it's not very clean. It gives you all sorts of nasty materials. Uh, you can break this down using things like acid or base because that will give you uh, the, the components back. And uh, ethylene glycol you can actually use to do this. So this has been studied quite a lot. You can actually recycle those things to get back to plastics that you can use again. So that's, that's a good start. A polymer that is becoming more and more popular and more and more useful is based on lactic acid. Now, where do you get lactic acid? It's in your muscles, isn't it? It's when you start cramping after you've been running or whatever. Lactic acid is a very simple, very readily available biological molecule. And engineers have been doing this. You can take these types of dimers, right? And you can heat them up, and you can make what's called polylactic acid, PLA. And this is on the way to replacing that ABS material I talked about earlier. It has very similar properties. It's a thermoplastic. When you heat it up, it, does, it melts. And when you cool it down, it's the same compound. You can reshape it, but it's still the same molecule, same compound. Well, it's got lots of different properties, very similar to things like uh, polyethylene terephthalate. On my little 3D thing at home, I've got one spool of this and one spool of the ABS, and they feel identical. They have the same brittleness. They have, when you bend it, it feels the same. So they have very similar properties. Um, this is used for all sorts of plastics uh, applications. But the nice thing is it's natural. And you can start with both of the two precursors, which you can get from natural sources. Uh, and then you can get all sorts of different polymers from this. And we've found now that people are starting to produce this on the 1,000 ton scale, which is starting to become industrial, industrially important, and replacing some of the compounds that are not degradable. This stuff should be degradable. This is an ester. We should be able to break it down simply by doing saponification, stuff like that. And I think, yeah, the last line says that people have found organisms that will actually break this stuff down. They will use this as a feedstock to get rid of it, which is very useful because then you've got a free natural source to be able to destroy the plastic that you've made. So after it's use is finished, you can actually get 
uh, this thing to break down. So keep an eye on that one in the future. I just brought this in because, again, PLA, great fun for kids. Eventually, this will become useful. I always wanted to put Lego bricks on my slides. I finally got my chance. They're made of PLA. You can make these things out of PLA with these 3D printers very easily. Uh, this is the one that I always make when, when the kids come over, which is the chess piece. It's very intricate. It's very, very detailed. And it takes about an hour to make it. But the kids are just stood there going, wow, it's like science fiction, right? But now it's science fact. And these are less than $1,000 these days and you know, roughly maybe the same as a decent iPad. And people will start to look at these things as serious things for the home at some point. Right. Having said that in terms of synthetic polymers, you also have to be aware, leaving my class going into other uh, subjects, that polymers span the universe in the sense of biological polymers are, are formed. We make synthetic polymers and they have very similar properties based on very similar chemical functional groups. So I have just a summary here of some of the things that we've seen a little bit of, but you need to take with you. We have amino acids. Look at that. They are bifunctional compounds. They are simple bifunctional compounds. You put that next to the nylons we just made, it's the same thing. These molecules can react on both sides. And if they keep reacting on both sides, you get a much longer chain by chain growth. So we're going to talk about biopolymers. We're going to talk about uh, proteins very quickly again, but from the polymer perspective. And carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are great because they contain all these different functional groups. And you can link those together in just infinite ways to make all sorts of materials. And the stereochemical changes here make a big difference. The functional groups make a big difference. If you polymerize this stuff, you get a very soft material. If you polymerize this stuff, as I'll show you in a second, you get a very hard material. So the functional group makes a big difference in terms of what the outcome is for the product, the material. And of course, we've also mentioned the nucleic acid, which can couple together to make dimers and trimers and oligomers, and then become polymers, RNA and DNA. And we have, again, functional groups. There's one that can link. There's another that can link. You can start to add these things in different directions and make polymers. So the examples of pictures, again, heading into biology, when you think of nucleic acids, Think of it as a chemist. Think of it as an organic chemist. They're simple polymers. They're simple molecules with functional groups that join together to make polymers. And that will help in the biochem, I think. Amino acids join together to make proteins. The three-dimensional structure of this is all about hydrogen bonding and repulsion and hydrophobic effects and stuff like that. But they're still polymers. It was just A plus B plus C plus D plus E to a certain degree to make this 3D structure. And then polysaccharides, which we'll see in a second. These are cell surface polysaccharides. Uh, they are just monomer units linked together through acetals to make polymers. We'll see some of those. So I have this alphabet. These are some of the carbohydrates that are commonly seen in mammalian metabolism. And you'll have to know their structures in the future. Certainly if you go into med school, you'll learn all about these things. And we can see some differences very quickly. Glucose has an equatorial hydroxyl there. Mannose is the, is the uh, diastereomer with a hydroxyl at C2. Here we have the hydroxyl pointing up at C4. That's galactose. Uh, glucose, replace the second OH for NHAC, you make gluconac. That material forms very hard polymers. Uh, we have the blood sugar type components, we have the galnac. Uh, the difference in terms of uh, being able to take certain types of blood is often one stereocenter on a sugar. If it's equatorial, it's the wrong one, it's actual, it's fine. Right? And you know all about the uh, inferences of getting the wrong type of blood. We can see here carboxyl groups, maybe we can link off that in gluc uh, glucuronic acid. And then down here, we get some of these really interesting ones which are used by things like bacteria to link to cells or viruses to link to cells. Uh, N-acetyl neuraminic acid, you'll see those a lot. And hydronic acid down here has sulfates and very polar materials. So those are the basic monomeric building blocks to make polymers. Now, we're getting better at this. Carbohydrate chemists are getting much better at doing this. But this is kind of the third final frontier in terms of synthesis. We can automate making RNA and DNA. We can use what's it called? Polymerase chain reaction, PCR. We can stick our monomers into a machine, dial in what we want, and we get out what we need. You may have done that yourselves. We can do that with amino acids. We can do automated amino acid peptide synthesis. So we can program in what we need and get out what we want. You can't do that with carbohydrates just yet. They're too complicated. One of the big goals from the, the community at the moment is to build an instrument, a machine, that will make you a polysaccharide. That will have massive influences in things like cancer biology, when we can build carbohydrates or bacterial infection, stuff like that. If we can build them from scratch very quickly, we'll be able to make medicines from there. I have no idea what this is. Uh, at the top, we have something called chitin. And chitin comes from crustacean shells, crab shells. Okay? And if you want the monomer, 
I did some of this stuff in Washington before I came over here. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to get this monomer, you wouldn't buy it, you'd go to Red Lobster and you'd get the leftovers. Yeah, you'd get all the crab shells and everything. And then you'd cook this stuff up in hydrochloric acid and then you'd crystallize out the gluten because it comes back. But if you polymerize this stuff, you get this. And look at this now. It is a polymer of carbohydrates, which is good in its own right. But you have this group over here with all this hydrogen bonding possibilities. So you can imagine how these things would come together for chains to come side by side. All right? You're getting a network now that is so strong it can form a protective shell. That's, that's impressive for a simple carbohydrate. Down at the bottom, uh, evil things like french fries contain starch. And starch is a glucose polymer. It's a very soft polymer, right? You usually see starch as a powder. And this is found in uh, potatoes and french fries and all types of things, and rice. And that's what we use to metabolize down to, to energy. So the carbohydrates, again, these are impressive in their structures, but also very impressive in their different properties based on simple structural uh, changes. Now, I do want to mention something here quite quickly. What is holding this together? What is the functional group holding this together? It's an acetal. What is the functional group holding this together? It's an acetal. On Friday, when I wrap this up and summarize and sort of give you some pointers for the final, functional groups. You're going to see some molecules on Monday. It's like, holy crap, what's happened there? But it's stuff that you should be able to do if you recognize functional groups. That's all you have to do. And then it should click, and it should go into practice. I have some other examples, just for FYI. Carbohydrates will get very important in your lifetimes, I would imagine. Uh, heparin is a... Uh, fairly well understood material, but it's very, very difficult to make. People are trying to make synthetic analogs of this stuff. It's used as an anticoagulant. And you'll find now that it has all sorts of different structures that you haven't seen a lot of, sulfate type groups. Uh, we have some complex carbohydrates, but guess what? These are held together by acetals. That's all it is. That's all they're linked together with. Cellulose from plants. Again, if you can recycle my grass on my garden, I'd be very happy. Uh, you can take cellulose because guess what? That's glucose. If you can turn cellulose in back into glucose, you've got a feedstock. Okay? That would help with, with hunger and things like that. If we could eat grass, that would be great. But we can't. Uh, so you find these polymers all over the place. The one that I'm interested in in my lab is this, which is a capsular polysaccharide. Bacteria tend to hide themselves from a host system by expressing carbohydrate polymers on their surface. And it's like a barbed wire that we can't get through. So people are trying to get through that barbed wire because it's, it prevents things like phagocytosis. Uh, and you can't really um, kill these things too well because there's carbohydrates there. But again, it's linked together with acetals, and it's a polymeric system, and it's something that hopefully will be made in the future so we can use them as, as pharmaceuticals. In terms of other types of things, uh, I've got plenty of time on Friday to finish this, so I've got to talk about uh, other bits and pieces. I'm not going to rush this. It's interesting stuff. So let's leave that there. And that's it. See you on Wednesday, on Friday.